Welcome to the Vanderbilt Philosophy faculty interviews. Today I'm joined by Professor Karen Ng. <laughs> and uh, Professor Ng is a specialist in 19th century uh, philosophy, in particular the German idealists, your Hegel, your Fichte, your Schellings. Uh, a specialist in uh, Frankfurt School uh, critical theory and teaches classes on Marx and political philosophy. Uh, Professor Ng uh, finished her uh, BA in philosophy at the University of Toronto in Canada, took an MA in philosophy at Essex in England, and then a PhD, <laughs> you see where I'm going, <laughs> and then a PhD in philosophy at the New School for Social Research in New York here in the United States. It's well-traveled uh, and just finished uh, a book, uh, Hegel's uh, Concept of Life uh, with Oxford University Press. Um, Professor Ng, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Um, how'd you get in philosophy? How did all this get started? And uh, all the globe hopping that, that comes along with that, that <laughs> philosophical education. Um, there's more globe hopping because I, I, I was born in Hong Kong. So I big, made a big, uh, big globe hop uh, before I ended up in, in Canada and Toronto. That wasn't on the CV that you shared with me. There were no, no degrees. I, my, my birth, <laughs> no, no degrees there. I was, you know, a kindergarten degree. <laughs> Didn't go on the academic CV. No. So, okay. But more globe hopping still. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I got into philosophy in high school. I was very lucky. I took a... Um, in my... This is... In, in Canada, I, I did a fifth year of high school. I did not... Not because I made any... <laughs> Sounds like you know. I made this is some, another thing that goes on the I CV. Made, I made some mistakes in my life, but no, at the time it was more like a British system where the fifth year of high school is kind of like your A levels. Oh, I see. Um, okay. So in my fifth year of high school, <laughs> I had I just I was very lucky. I had an incredible teacher who I took um, both a politics class with and a philosophy class with, and he he just cha he introduced us to, to like Plato to, to Aristotle Nietzsche Kant and it was high school already Kant yeah, selections oh, amazing. selections and it changed my life he was he's amazing um, I don't I, I have not been in contact with him but his name was Scott Hallern and he he changed the, the course of my life and my studies an early uh, an early uh, sort of touch of the of the of the, the sort of the magic of philosophy and you showed up in college uh, already knowing what it was and maybe already having the bug? I had the bug, but I think I, I started as a political science major. Okay. Um, and I think I didn't, what I didn't understand is that political, political science is not political theory or political philosophy. <laughs> and eventually it became very clear. I took, I was taking philosophy classes because I'd already caught the bug and all my time and energies and my entire mind was always taken up by my philosophy classes. So I quickly realized and I switched. <laughs> Uh, it's a it, that that right there is a is a story that uh, that lots of philosophers tell that they 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 find that they are in areas and find the theoretical questions there and they burn <laughs> with those and they say there's a department entirely devoted to that <laughs> right just the theoretical questions yeah, right. yeah exactly so uh, so your specializations uh, and in particular uh, 19th century German idealism um, let's talk about the the recent book on Hegel's concept of life um, so tell us a little bit about what the concept of life is and what are the stakes for that question so that's obviously a huge question um, and maybe what I, I I would begin by saying that Clearly, the concept of life can be used in many different senses. So there's a biological concept of life. Um, there is maybe there is even a, a political uh, concept of life. Um, what's I think really just Hegel is coming out of a tradition where thinking about the concept of life in a philosophical context is not uh, so odd. <laughs> um, and I think what the so he's coming out of a tradition where natural philosophy and philosophy are fully blended um, so questions of the nature of living beings were basically questions that philosophers took up which isn't which wasn't weird in that context but it maybe sounds a little bit weirder for us um, and so I think what was so unique um, what motivated what, what got me into the to, into the topic and actually it was inspired by uh, my dis my dissertation topic it was also on Hegel um, is that in his book, The Science of Logic, um, which you would presume is a book about logic, <laughs> um, there is in a very important concluding moment in the conclusion of the text, um, all of a sudden he dedicates an entire chapter to life. And that led me down this, that was my, that was the trigger that sort of led me on this path <laughs> to figure out, well, what the heck 
is uh, the concept of life doing in presumably, you know, a book, a textbook about logic. Right. So one of the one of the key things that you're wrestling with is life as a logical concept. So um, maybe we'll back up back up one second and say, would it, would it count for something to be a logical concept, and how is life then a logical concept? So it's very odd to say that life is a logical concept. Um, my um, entry point into that is, and in the broadest, to put it in the broadest sense, I think it's the a logical concept of life is interested in thinking about the concept of life in connection with the question of judgment. Um, and I tried to argue that the precedent for this, so although it's very odd for Hegel to do this, <laughs> to, to talk about life and organisms and, and, and corporeality and you know, processes of assimilation in the book on logic, uh, my, what, I, I, I trace this back to, um, uh, it was Kant who first introduced um, the question of life in connection with judgment. Um, and so broadly speaking, a logical concept of life pertains to, well, what is significant about life um, when we're interested in thinking about what judgment is? And so one of the features of this is that it's, they, it's that it's a normative concept then. Um, and uh, one of the features of these normative concepts is in terms of identifying purposes. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, so tell us how purpose uh, relates to this concept. So purposes, this is also something that just so, you know, Hegel draws a lot of ideas from Kant while you know, transforming them in really interesting ways. But one of the interesting thing that Kant does, um, and I think he actually adopts this in part from Aristotle, um, is that he draws this distinction between thinking about purposes uh, or ends. Um, I think sometimes in, in the English translation of the text, some uh, in the old, older translation it was purpose and now it's translated as end, but I think the ideas are related. Okay. Um, telos, zweck in German. Um, Purposes can be external or they can be internal. Um, uh, purposes external when it uh, we think about relations of, so Kant's example is that sandy soil is externally purposive or basically beneficial for spruces. That's a relationship of external uh, purposiveness as he calls it. Um, an internal purpose is an end or aim that is exhibited in the activities and the form of the, of the organism itself. Um, and so this is, this is, Kant calls this a concept of internal purposes. And so um, one of the things that comes out of this analysis of the concept, the logical concept of life, is what you call the speculative identity thesis. Uh, tell us a little bit about what the speculative identity thesis is. That's a tough one, and I, that's, that's a, the, Hegel is known for his very technical, sometimes, uh, difficult <laughs> terminology. And so it might not, it, it's not the most felicitous uh, uh, way of putting, uh, putting this particular idea. But ultimately, um, so he, if I were to sum up the thesis of idealism in one sentence, so one, one sentence, it would be that knowledge of objects and self-knowledge are intimately and dialectically related. Um, that we cannot actually understand how we can have knowledge of objects without also saying something about self-knowledge. Um, and in, in the tradition from Kant to German idealism, and arguably even before that, um, qu questions of self-knowledge are often bound up with questions of self-consciousness. Um, and basically, speculative identity thesis is a very, very technical way of putting this idea um, that, uh, this, this idea that self-consciousness should be understood in terms of self-conscious life. Um, and this is, I think, one innovation that Hegel gives us, because I think philosophers have been thinking about self-consciousness for a long time, especially in the modern tradition. Um, but there is something, a shift happens um, with Hegel. Um, and I also show that this is not exclusive to Hegel. You know, he gets this in part from um, people like Schelling, um, that self-consciousness should be understood as, in terms of self-conscious life. And so this is what then uh, comes out of this lo life as a logical concept, uh, that there is a self-reflective element to that and a self-regarding element in the life. Exactly, that life itself manifests or expresses um, a lot, uh, not just the self-reflexivity that you might see in self-consciousness, but I think many features of mindedness, that um, there are feature, proto-cognitive features that we can identify in the form and shape and activity and processes of living things, um, out of which grow self-consciousness, so that we don't have this 
purely so what that what why why is that helpful um it avoids right. dualism <laughs> right so yeah. that's the big that's the big thing right um it makes self-consciousness it's it's not some it's not sui generis it's not um it, it we, we don't have to be dualists in order to account for the phenomenon of self-consciousness i think that's really important um it also allows us to understand and in the book i draw sort of some connections to more romantic ways of thinking about nature where nature is not just seen as dead mechanism but seen as expressing you know features that look like they are already proto-rational uh, so we have here uh the refinement of a particular concept and a and an important one the concept of life um, some new work that you're working on is the refinement of, of another concept that's in some ways a little closer to home, uh, which is the concept human, and in particular humanism. Um, so tell us about the stakes for being able to clarify um, and really defend a humanist tradition. So humanism, I think many philosophers, uh, including philosophers of the Enlightenment, have defended uh, versions of humanism. Humanism has also been subjected to many, many, many different kinds of critique. So one concern is that it's um, overly essentialist, um, it presupposes some eternal unchanging essence of the human being. Um, it doesn't uh, attend to not just historical specificity, but geographical and cultural specificity. Um, Nonetheless, um, one of the things that I'm trying to do in this newer project, um, and specifically in one of the new papers that I just finished up, is to try to defend humanism <laughs> against some of these, lo some longstanding, some newer critiques, so specifically that it is problematically essentialist. I think humanism can be compatible with historical and evolutionary understandings of the human being. Um, I also defended against um, speciesism, that humanism has to assume something like uh, you know, a scala natura a hierarchy where humans are at the top. So we want to be humanist with that. We, we, we want to try to think about humanism without falling into that trap. Um, and I also try to defend humanism against a very recent critique um, by Kate Mann, who argues that humanism is basically, it, it's, it, it underdetermines and it's idle. So I can recognize you as human and that that's basically completely ethically, normatively idle. I can, yeah. I can see that you're human and still mistreat you in all kinds of ways. Right. In fact, it may even make the mistreatment of, of a particular stripe and a exactly. different kind of motive. Yes. So, um, and so the stakes then for clarifying, so we have a defense of this tradition, but what are the stakes? What would we, what would we lose if we didn't have a humanist tradition? I think we would lose, so maybe we can, I can back up a bit. Why would I be committed to humanism? There's, there's sort of a, a maybe a very sort of meta, uh, a, a meta philosophical reason for this. And it's partially connected to some of the work that I've been doing on the concept of life is this commitment to species specificity and the way that um, species, some broad notion of species or kind. So first of all, is important for uh, identifying and understanding and grasping individuals. So one of the things that com comes out of um, my reading of Hegel, and lots of people have argued this about Hegel, is that Hegel understands the individual and the concrete universal to be intimately connected. So if that's the, if that's, so that's generally true, that's got to be true for every individual thing, including individual human beings, right? You're not really going to ever understand some individual, and no matter how unique, and we're all very unique, <laughs> without denying that, all of us are still manifestations or expressions of the concrete universal that is a human being. So that's sort of a, so part of that grows from that metaphilosophical commitment to the importance of um, species concepts for understanding any particular individual thing. Um, the second, so I, I mentioned species specificity. One of the things, so this humanism project, uh, I, I was also trying to understand sort of this puzzle. Um, in the early Marx, uh, he, he says something like, well, we have to be able to understand certain forms of oppression. So of course, they're all historically specific, but he says we also need to understand this as a form of dehumanization. So then the question is, well, why? What do we what do we lose? And it seems I think the claim is something like species specificity is very important for understanding the possibilities and conditions both of flourishing 
and, and, and growth, but also then, right, on the flip side, to really be able to understand and diagnose how things go wrong, how we mistreat each other, how certain um, practices or institutions or relationships can um, be harmful or, or, or um, incapacitate us in different kinds of ways. All of those kinds of analysis, all, analyses also have to be species specific because otherwise we are not going to have an adequate understanding of what's going right or wrong. So the, so the, the stakes then are, if we don't have a relatively clear humanist tradition, the objection of something being dehumanizing loses its bite. Mm -hmm. It loses its bite and I, I think it's both conceptually important that we can understand, it's both, con at least for, for someone like Marx, but I think also more broadly, it's both conceptually important and, you know, politically and ethically important that forms of, right, that, that flourishing and its opposite, <laughs> flourishing and, and forms of uh, oppression that literally, I think, deactualize the human being in a certain kind of way, that all of that really needs to be understood against um, the background of an right evol not not a fixed essence, but of an evolving right continually developing understanding of what it is to be human. So the crucial thing that it sounds like is that there are sort of two edges to this critical reconstruction. On the one hand, we have the concept. Let's imagine that we've got the concept human. We've got you might say the abuses of the concept of human mm -hmm. uh, that you might say the speciesist or the uh, uh, or some version of racist uh, mm -hmm. applications of that of that of that term have been used, and so we have to refine it well so that we don't get the abuses that the term yeah. has. But we also need to be able to craft it so that it actually can have the right kind of uses and critical uses, yeah. in particular in calling out particular kinds of oppression. Exactly. To understand, so one other um, thinker who's been very, I think, is, is very important to thinking about this question. Um, when you talk about the abuses of humanism is Frantz Fanon. So Frantz Fanon is highly, highly critical of the abuses of, uh, of, of basically racist <laughs> forms of humanism, right? And basically the, it's, it's simple. They're just, fa they're false. They're, they're false. false universals. They're yes. just false. That's, that's not the concept, right? That's an exclusionary um, false conception of the human being. But nonetheless, uh, he insists that in order to understand, so his context is very specifically about anti-colonial struggles, um, that to understand the very historically and right, geographically, culturally, all of those things, right? So we attend to the specificity of that particular form, uh, that particular oppressive situation, but that it's very important that, you know, that we understand that both against the background um, of a, 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 an ever always developing conception of human flourishing, but also that in, in the struggle itself, what we do is we change our conception of what it is to be human and, and what we think the human being is. So um, he's a really great thinker for exactly as you say, being aware of all of the pitfalls um, that humanist discourse can lead us to, but on the other hand, really insisting that to understand oppression in a deep way, and also I, I take it to understand how to rectify it, um, something about the concept of the human has to remain in view. That's very clear. And I can imagine that your students appreciate that clarity. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about your classes. Um, so uh, we've had, so and this is, uh, we're recording this uh, here at the end of the fall semester of 2021. Uh, and so right now you're teaching uh, a seminar on Marx's work. Uh, tell us a little bit about that seminar and um, how that's gone. And, some, and then I'm gonna ask you some questions about some, um, some previous courses and then some other things that are kind of in the works. Um, I think the course is going well. You'll have to ask my students. <laughs> um, you have to see the final papers. <laughs> this, is, this is my first time teaching the class, but I think okay. so far it's been great. The course is basically uh, structured around. So I, unlike, um, well, actually, I think Hegel is read in a lot of different, different disciplines, but I think uh, Marx as a philosopher is, th th there, there needs to be, particular attention paid because he is so much more, he, he's sort of a, a, an interdisciplinary thinker, uh, uh, right? Before we use this term, this fancy word, interdisciplinary. I think the work is genuinely interdisciplinary, but of course we're in a philosophy department and I'm a philosopher. So I'm very, always very interested in reading it through 
you know, a distinctly philosophical lens. Some of that involves, you know, the history of philosophy, where I try to really draw out the Aristotelian and, of course, Kantian and Hegelian um, sort of background of a lot of his thinking. Um, but then also thematically, we try to think about questions, you know, we, we actually talked a lot about this question of, of, of purposes and how it might play a role, you know, and that he marks as a bit of an Aristotelian in the way that he understands the human being and human activity. And so those are the kinds of, um, we're, we're really attending to the philosophical parts <laughs> of, of Marx's texts. And so uh, previously, or so in the book, so right now we also have a class on critical theory uh, that was uh, that was this last spring. That yes. was in the spring of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, class on critical theory and uh, a seminar on German idealism. Mm -hmm. Tell us about a little bit about those those classes. So German idealism is a trip. Uh, I love teaching it, but I always uh, I it it's it's the, so it's a trip because the texts of the German idealists are probably some of the most difficult texts ever to be written in the history of, of Western philosophy. Um, they're difficult, and it, the, they're difficult. It's not just be we read them in translation, but that doesn't account. That's not enough to account for why <laughs> saying in English sentences. Yeah, is it, it, that's not, not quite why it, it, it's just difficult. <laughs> um, you know, going back to these the, the, the speculative identity thesis. Right. You know, why do we have to talk? <laughs> that wasn't way? English. Those were English words. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's not better when you you have it in German. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, but I love teaching. It, it's a trip because it is, it's a class that requires very close attention to the text. So it, it's, it's sort of the forest and the trees. You, you have to read very slowly and very carefully, but we also have to do enough work, you know, stepping outside basically to sort of see the whole and reconstruct those arguments in, in a bigger picture view. Otherwise you're going to get lost just in the sheer difficulty of the text. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I love teaching the course on German idealism. Um, some of the themes uh, we, we've talked about, um, we, we always talk about the, the question of self-consciousness and what, uh, what's, what, what self-consciousness actually consists in. Um, there we read, we read a lot of Fichte. Um, we talk a lot about the question of systematic philosophy. The German idealists are system builders. Everything is interconnected. <laughs> we can't talk about one thing without talking about all the other things because everything is always connected in a systematic, organic yeah, whole. Right. Organic unities. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And and that's true of knowledge. Knowledge is also an organic unity. So, um, so <laughs> we talk a lot about um, the, and because we, we talk a lot about system building because system building has a very bad reputation in the in the 20th century and probably also in the 21st century. There's not a lot of people who are self-avowed system, system builders. builders. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and so we have um, this course that's um, that's uh, primarily and it satisfies one of our history requirements for the philosophy major. Uh, but then we have the critical theory course, which is temporary contemporary issues and this and this um, Frankfurt School tradition yielding um, both historically informed analyses, but uh, this is less his doing philosophical work in the history of philosophy. Mm -hmm. This is contemporary, these are contemporary writers, contemporary issues. Um, and so uh, tell us about the, the approach in this class. So that's a great, I love teaching that class. I teach it, that class I teach differently every time. Okay. Um, there are classes where, you know, there are broad things that you cover every time you teach it. Um, like in German, there are some texts that I'm just going to teach if I'm teaching German idealism, but critical theory Not going to be any Hegel in your German idealism <laughs> course this time around, what is it? So, but critical theory is different every time. Um, some of the themes that we talk about include sort of um, forms of political critique. So the Frankfurt School, uh, arose within a political uh, a context, um, sort of in the mid early and middle part of the 20th century in Germany. Um, obviously, with the um, with the the arrival of National Socialism, a lot of these scholars uh, who were German Jewish scholars had to flee, and a lot of them came to the United States. So we uh, sometimes we read Arendt uh, and the critique of totalitarianism. So we talk about um, political forms of critique. Another theme that uh, I love and students also love is to think about cultural critique. Um, so forms of art, but more specifically of the culture industry um, and the ways in which, you know, the, the culture, the movies, the music, all of the fun stuff that we, we love to consume. Um, what kinds of consequences does that have, um, uh, not just on individuals and their capacities for thinking and reasoning and, and, um, and how it shapes their desires, but also, right, on a big scale as a society? Um, what is the role of these cultural products? Um, so those are some of the themes. 
that we talk about in critical theory. So tell me about some classes that are in the works, things that are things that are upcoming, things that are bubbling through. What are we planning? So you have rec you recently um, invited me to teach a class on the meaning of life, and I was I'm very excited about that. Um, I was maybe I'm being too clever or wanted to give it a sort of very different interpretation. So not I'm not going to have any answers about you know existential questions about the meaning okay. of life. But I was I wanted to um, frame the class around the ways that philosophers, so going back to your very first question, have treated the concept of life. So beginning with Aristotle, thinking about life as soul. <laughs> Um, moving through sort of maybe more, you know, mechanistic uh, Cartesian ways of thinking about life. Kant thinks that life is a capacity for representation and an ability to act on those representations. So, um, so it's the meaning of life. Exactly. <laughs> How philosophers to, exactly. That's what I was, I was going so to. So clever. I, okay, got too, it. I hope it's not too clever. <laughs> it's, uh, it's delicious. Uh, it's um, awesome. <laughs> and, you know, bring us all the way up to the present. Um, think about questions in, in the philosophy of mind um, that are increasingly uh, going, you know, I, I also said earlier, you know, Hegel thinks of self-consciousness as self-conscious life. I think that's an idea that's increasingly, right, getting a lot of traction, that um, a lot of philosophers of mind precisely think about mind from the perspective of its connection to, it's not just its connection to, but that it is uh, life, that mindedness and life are basically <laughs> completely continuous. So, uh, and uh, it's funny that you recall that I had asked you to do that. Uh, that's part of the philosophy department's commitment to our uh, folks in the leadership, folks uh, in uh, at the at the heads of the discipline, not just teaching graduate seminars and upper division courses, but also teaching intro level, 1000 level classes. And so this is part of our reorientation in terms of our involvement in all levels of the education uh, for undergraduates. And so not just the, the graduate students and the first, and the, uh, don't, don't just get to teach that class. We get that, <laughs> we get that one too. Um, so uh, have, we, have we got a graduate seminar in the works coming up? Uh, yes. So tell us, about, so this tell us is, about that. This is one I've been wanting to teach for a while. I want to teach a class called Philosophies of Right. And what I want to do is think about um, the concept of right um, as it emerges in classical German philosophy, basically roughly running from Kant to Fichte to Hegel, um, where they have this concept that they think about right as a relation. Um, and in some contexts, it's more of a political concept, but in other contexts, it's more of an ethical concept. And so thinking about right, a, a right, not as something, right, it's not as something we have, um, but as a relationship is something that I find very interesting to come out of this tradition. And I would want to, I would love to teach a graduate seminar, just, you know, concept of right and Kant, Fichte and Hegel. And a, and a developing, a developing story on that particular focused bit of research and uh, continuing with uh, more of your, uh, more of your research uh, focus, which is clarifying important concepts, <laughs> life, <laughs> human, and right. Uh, see the next book coming out of that one, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks for that. All right. Hey, all right. Good ideas coming out of this interview. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? I'd sometimes sometimes I, I, I circulate the list. I should and ask sometimes you I, some questions. I mean... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have opinions, uh, but uh, thanks for your time with us. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank and you. Thanks for, for sharing it. Yeah, thanks for talking to me and for all your questions, Scott. Awesome. All right. 